All right, now, we're really going to be doing a lot of studying tonight through the book of Hebrews. Okay, and the book of Hebrews is designed, I mean, specifically written and addressed to a specific group of people, the Hebrews, right? The people who were physically of the seed of Abraham. Now, we look through, you see the epistles of Paul, and he writes to different churches, the church of Thessalonica, you know, the church in, uh, in Rome, the church, you know, all over the place. And, and you have these different epistles. This, and they all have their own audience, Right now, it's still all the Bible and it's all applicable. It's all God's word and we can learn from all of it. I don't think that this is only for the Jews and this is only for the Gentiles and this is only for the Romans. I don't buy into that. Right. I mean, it's for everybody, but we have to understand the context, you know, who it's going to, because what, what's happening in the book of Hebrews is very important for the pivot, for the transition between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He's, he's preaching to people here. He's writing this epistle to, the, to the, Hebrews, you know, the, the author of Hebrews, which you know God is the author, the ultimate author anyways. But this is to, to provide the explanation, to give them the insights and what are the changes, what is different now. Because the Hebrew, when you go out to the Gentiles, the Gentiles weren't practicing all the animal sacrifices and everything else that was going along with being a worshiper of the Lord. You know, I mean, you may have had some believers in pockets and Gentile nations, but by and large, it's not what was happening. When the Apostle Paul went out and, and, and started, you know, getting people saved and churches started coming up, there wasn't as much of an issue for the, for the change because you're just getting them started right. I mean, just getting them started on this is what we do. You know, you believe on Christ. This is the truth. Here you go. And this is what, you know, and this is kind of the way that we worship. This is, this is how we're going to do things. But to the Hebrews, to the people who have been in Israel, the people who have been in Jerusalem, and the people who are getting saved, this is very important. We need to get nail this down. Okay, what's the difference? And for Christians today, there's a lot of people out there that get very confused about the, the, the you know, the Old Testament versus the New Testament, what stands, what doesn't stand. And, you know, you get all kinds of different opinions and all kinds of, of nonsense and heresies and false doctrine. And people will say, you know, basically, well, we're free in Christ, so the law is just gone. And, and look, that is utter nonsense. And we're going to see here, I'm going to cover a few points that are, I think are really important for understanding the differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the book of Hebrews really spells out a lot of that. Now, the book of Hebrews, in general, the main point is just like the main point anywhere else. It's about salvation. I mean, it goes into great detail here between, you know, about Melchizedek and Jesus being that of that priesthood because they're just coming out of the Mosaic law and, and the priesthood where Aaron and his descendants were priests. And that it was, it was a hereditary thing, and they're following hereditary rules on who can be priests and who couldn't and who could serve the Lord, you know, the Levites. And, and, and that was given to them through the commandment of, of God to serve in that way. And what this does, it explains a lot about, well, because the priesthood is changing, it's no longer the priesthood of Aaron. It's no longer the Levites. Now it's, we're, we're, we're switching from that priesthood because they blew it, because they couldn't keep that covenant, because that Old Testament needed to, to go away. This is the new covenant. This is the new priesthood. This is, you know, the way things are. And along with that, the Bible explains, and especially in the book of Hebrews, why there's a difference is what those differences specifically are. And we're going to dig in a lot to that tonight. So just a real quick overview over some of the chapters, because I'm not going to do all of them. They all have great content and they all have some different things. But by and large, I mean, the book of Hebrews only doesn't cover that much. I mean, it's, it's pretty, uh, there's a lot of talk about the priesthood. And you said, you know, because it comes up over and over and over again throughout the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 3 introduces Moses and Jesus. And that's where you start to really get the contrast between the Mosaic law and what Jesus is doing. And, to, you know, and, and, and at no point is it ever contradictory. Is it ever saying that, you know, Jesus is getting rid of the Mosaic law? What it is more, it's saying that. It's the, it's the fulfillment. It's saying, you know, in Hebrews 3, I believe it is, where it's talking about Moses, you know, how, how great and, 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 you know, and, and how great the law was and everything that he did, but how Jesus 
is so much greater than Moses, just as much as he that built the house is greater than the house itself. And so it's, it kind of introduces both of them. They're saying, hey, Moses was great. Hey, Moses gave us the law of God. Amen and amen. He's a great man of God, but Jesus is so much better. Like, this is what we're dealing with here. And there's no contradiction at all. It's just, it's just illustrating that and explaining that. And this is where the beginning of the explanations of the Old Testament of the law and what they meant then and what they mean in the New Testament. And that's really where you start getting into this. Is it kind of begins in Hebrews chapter 3. You get into Hebrew, in chapter 5, it starts, um, you know, Hebrews 3 uses Moses and Jesus. Hebrews 5 then brings Aaron into the picture because Aaron was, was the one anointed as the priest. You know, the priesthood came from his line. And it starts likening, you know, the, the aspects of Jesus or aspects of Aaron with Jesus. It says as, as Aaron was the priest under the old covenant, now Jesus is the priest in the new covenant. And even what we read here in Hebrews 7, it's explaining that, you know, with the old covenant, with the priesthood, they were men. And they would die and they had to come in, they had to offer up their offerings for their own sins and also for the sins of the people. And it was something they did every single year and they had to keep on doing this and it was perpetual and what he's explaining is that, yeah, that's the way things were, but because Jesus Christ is, lives forever, because Jesus Christ doesn't die, he's a priest forever. There is no changing of the priesthood. There's no, excuse me, nobody filling his shoes. And the sacrifice that he made is so much better than the sacrifices that were being offered unto God that he made that sacrifice once for all. He did it one time and it paid everything. And you know, that's just kind of a brief overview of that. And, and, and the verse I want to point out here in, in Hebrews 7, verse 12 says, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. It's not a disannulling of the law. It's not tossing the law. It's not, well, that was the Old Testament. We're getting rid of that and we're starting over again from scratch. There's a change, though. There are some things that have been changed. I mean, the most obvious, for example, and we're going to get into more changes later, nobody's doing burnt sacrifices anymore. Nobody's doing that. I mean, the Jews aren't even doing that. Nobody does that. Why? Because there's been a change in the law, and that was one of the changes. We'll get into more of the changes later, but it's important that we understand this because so many people are teaching this. Basically, they don't like some of the things that the Old Testament teaches, so they just want to get rid of it. And because the Old Testament is so much bigger than the New Testament, there's more stuff in there. There's more things not to like when... You have, oh, and this is great because my binder's broken. <laughs> this illustrates my point perfectly. Now, I have like a concordance and a couple other things in the back here, not very much. You see the difference between Old Testament and New Testament? Old Testament on top, New Testament on the bottom. Okay, and some people want to go, well, we'll just rip this out and we're just going to stick with the New Testament. I mean, I was even talking to someone today that was saying that didn't like, specifically, they didn't like some of the things that the Apostle Paul said. Well, that's what Paul said. And I was talking to a woman, and, and there were things that she didn't like that the Apostle Paul said about women keeping silence in the church, and it's not permitted for, you know, all those different things. And it's like, well, that's what Paul said. Well, no, that's what God said. Right. Those are God's words. Right. And, you know, and she was a nice lady, and I believe she was safe. But there's all these different things. And it's kind of interesting where when people don't like something, they will come up with any reason to make an excuse for not actually believing what the Bible says. So it's, oh, well, the culture, that's, you know, people throw out the word culture. Oh, you need to understand the culture. Or they'll throw out, well, you know, starting to doubt God's word. Is that really what God said? How do we know what, this, you know, what the Bible says? And then it was ultimately going down to, well, that's why we have the Holy Spirit, right, to tell us those things. No, no, that's not, that's not why. It's not the, it's not the, well, whatever feel, the whatever way I feel when I read this is true. And that's all it is. It's, 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 a, it's some excuse to try to throw away parts of the Bible, the, the parts that you don't like. And people do that, and they've been doing it all throughout history, and they're continuing to do it today. But if you're going to be honest with yourselves, you're going to be honest with God, if you, have, if you have a sincere faith, we ought to be able to say, this is what God's Word says, and we're going to believe it because that's what it says. Amen. And we're not going to throw things away because they're not sweet or they're not kind or we think they're not loving, right. we're going to believe what it says. And Hebrews, like I said, we're going we're to go into this 
and see what are the differences? What are the changes? Because he's not going to tell us, well, there's made of a ch change of the, of the law also, and you guys are just going to have to figure that out. <laughs> right? I mean, he tells us explicitly, here are the changes. We're going to get into that. But the first thing, before we go any further, I want to bring up this point. I don't teach on this very often. I, I, I've done, I think, maybe one sermon on this, maybe two. I'm not sure if I've done more than one. And that's the issue of tithing. And it's very related to this because you have these movements like the Hebrew Roots Movement, which originally I was going to I was going to do a sermon dedicated to that, but I kind of pivoted from from what I want to teach on and kind of go into all of their various things that they that they hold to. And basically what they do is they want to go back to the Old Testament laws that have been changed. Like they want to you know, bring back the Sabbath and bring back the feasts and bring back all these things that have already been changed. And it's like, no, there has been a change of the law. You know, we're not going back to, to some of these other things. And one of the things that's very common, though, among the Hebrew Roots type movement and, and other, other movements as well, the home church movement is another one, where they say that tithing was something that was only for the Old Testament. That was under the Levitical priesthood. It was to take care of the Levites. And it wasn't take care of the Levites. Yes, it was. It was to help them because they dedicated their life to serving the law, to serving God, and, and to performing uh, the sacrifice and doing all these things and, and working full time in the service of the Lord. So they were to be taken care of. They didn't have a physical inheritance like the, the, you know, the rest of the children. The, all the other tribes had inheritance. They received land. They received you know, their inheritance where they can work, where they can cultivate, where they could you know, grow crops, where they could have animals, where they could do all these different things. The Levites didn't have that. Why? Because they were working for the Lord full time. They were going to be doing the service of the Lord, taking down the tabernacle, putting it up, you know, performing all the sacrifices, all that stuff. So they're going to be taken care of. And it made a lot of sense. And that's where people will say, well, see, because that was, you know, what part of, you know, one of the reasons, and that's not the only reason, by the way, of the tithe. The tithe also took care of the widows. It also took care of the fatherless. It also took care of basically those who were in need that needed to be supported by someone. They were supported through the church, right? Through, through the service of God. And it's interesting because when you look in the New Testament, the church is responsible for all of those things. The church is responsible for, for compensating and, and taking care of the people who are working full time for God. And for the widows, the widows who are widows indeed, that's why it gives us a whole, you know, all the, the um, qualifications to, to consider. Is someone a widow? Because if they have family members, the family is supposed to take care of them. And guess what? It's the same way in the Old Testament. If they had family members, the family members are supposed to take care of them. But widows who are widows indeed, they're going to be taken care of through God, through, through the church. All of the same reasons exist today that existed back then for the tithe. And... Um, What's real interesting is here, and we see this even in chapter 7, that's why I started off reading the whole thing, we see tithing was happening to Melchizedek from Abraham before the law of Moses was ever even given. There was a tithe paid to Melchizedek. So you say, yeah, but there's a change of the priesthood because the tithes were under the Aaron, the, the Aaron priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood. Now we're under Melchizedek. Well, guess what? Melchizedek received tithes. So if you're going to say, well, because of the change in the priesthood, now there's no more tithing. Well, who's pri what's the priesthood we're under now? Melchizedek. Did Melchizedek receive tithes? Yes, he did. And I believe that's one of the reasons this is even brought up in this chapter. It says there's a change in law, but it says that Melchizedek received tithes. There's and, there's, and by the way, there's absolutely no change noted here either about, well, tithing's done away with at all. It actually says, if anything, it proves the opposite because it's saying, well, hey, Melchizedek received tithes, even of those people who get the tithes right now. Right. I mean, the very people, you know, Levi, while he was in his father's loins, right? Abraham paid those tithes and Levi was in his father's loins, basically paying the tithes to Melchizedek. So if they were paying tithes, if Levi, who receives the tithes, pay tithes, then what do you think that we should be doing today? Of course we should be paying the tithes. Of course we should. But, you know, there's a lot of people out there, many of whom are greedy. Now, I don't want to say all of them are. But many people have been deceived into thinking, that, oh, well, that's not for us anymore in the New Testament. Show me where that has been repealed. You can't find it. it, it nowhere say, oh, the, the, and they'll bring up verse. And I don't want to go into this too much because it's, it's really only a small point of the sermon. 
They'll say, oh, yo, but see, the Bible says that God loveth a cheerful giver. And they'll quote that verse. And it's like, you know what that passage is about? That passage is about giving money to help saints in another church in another city. When in context. I mean, if you read the verses in context, if you want to actually understand what the Bible's teaching, just like when it talks about get, you know, let not your left hand know what your right hand doeth. Oh, well, how can you do that if you have to give 10%? You need to know what your right hand is doing if you're giving 10%. Yeah, it's when you give alms. Let not your left hand know what your right hand doeth. Giving alms and giving tithes are two different things. Just like bringing in a sin offering and bringing in a free will offering are two different things. Bringing in the first fruits is different. They're different things. The tithe is not the same as giving alms. It's not the same as helping out missionaries. It's not the same as helping out other saints in another church. So when the Apostle Paul was asking and requesting, hey, set aside some money so that these people who are in need can, can be helped out a little bit by, you know, by, by your, by your um, abundance, God loves a cheerful giver. Help these people out. Nowhere is he talking about the tithe. So we got, I mean, you, look, we're going to study the Bible. Let's study it in context. Let's read and try to understand what is he talking about. There's many ways to give. It's not all about the tithe. Every time you see anything about giving money, it's not about the tithe. That's all I want to say about this. I mean, it comes up here because we're talking about changes to the law. But it, it definitely, there's a lot more scripture behind why we believe tithing is still perfectly applicable today. And the biggest one is just that it's never talked about being done away with. The tithe has not been fulfilled. Because ultimately what we see, I'm going to get a little bit ahead of myself, what we see with the changes in the law is fulfillment in the law. It's what has been fulfilled. What, what is no longer needed because, honestly, the things that were needed back then were really just giving us a picture and, and, and teaching a truth Excuse me, that, we're, that is to come. Right. And we're going to see that. Turn, if you went to Hebrews chapter 8, we're going to see that here. Now, I suggest after the sermon tonight, go back home and read Hebrews 7, Hebrews 8, Hebrews 9, Hebrews 10, because we're not going to go through all of them, but these are, if you want to really kind of get a good grip on all these different changes and stuff, they, they go into a lot more detail I'm going to go into tonight regarding the specific changes and all the meaning behind all the sacrifices and everything else. So Hebrews chapter 8, we're going to jump down to verse number 7. The Bible reads, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. He's saying, hey, if there was no problems with that first covenant, with the, with, with the, the covenant that Moses brought in, if it was perfectly fine, then there wouldn't be any reason for a second one. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. And, you know, I just want to make this point here real quick, is that salvation has never been by the law. And it becomes abundantly clear, like I said, the more you just read through all these chapters, especially in chapter 9, and we're going to get to that in a little bit, salvation has never been, you know, some people like to think, oh yeah, well, they were saving the Old Testament by keeping God's law. They were saving the Old Testament by bringing in their sacrifices every year. They, no, they weren't. The whole reason why we have a new covenant is because they weren't able to keep that covenant, and God even said it back in the Old Testament right after he gave them the new covenant, you know, that old covenant. Right. He says, well, you guys can't keep this. Well, I'm going to give you a new one in the future. I'm going to write my laws into your hearts. And you're not going to have to wonder, you know, say to your neighbor, do you know the Lord? Because everyone's going to know me. So I'm going to write it in your heart. And he says, that, you know, this is something that he was going to do. Verse number 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. That's key. That's salvation. He said, I'm not going to remember their sins at all anymore. See, under this old covenant of bringing in the sacrifices, there's always a remembrance of sin because it never purges your sins away. The blood of bulls and of goats, it cannot purge away your sins. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So yeah, it's, it's, it, let's keep reading here. Verse number thir 13. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxing old, waxeth old 
is ready to vanish away. It's ready to vanish away. It hasn't vanished away completely. It's not gone. The law is not just, just no longer there anymore. But it decays and it's waxing old. It's ready to vanish away. Turn if you would to Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 1. We'll keep reading here. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made the first wherein was, in, wherein was a candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So it's saying the first covenant under the Old Testament, there was ordinances. There were rules. There were some commandments. There was laws regarding the divine service, the service to God. That would be the offering up the sacrifices, the meat offerings, the drink offerings, all of that stuff, right? And a worldly sanctuary. There was a sanctuary. They had the tabernacle built, and it was built to very specific specifications given, given to Moses by God, saying this is the way it's going to be. You need to have it this be all. Here's all the dimensions. Here's what materials you're going to use. I want it looking like this. Here's the images you're going to carve into the stuff. You know, everything was laid out specifically. Right. And God even said, you know, I've prepared the hearts of some people who are cunning workers in, in brass and silver and, you know, and all this different in needlework and everything else so that you could perform this and it could be done right. And uh, basically what they did was created an image of what, is already, what was already existing in heaven. The sanctuary that exists literally in heaven, a replica was created here on earth. And the service that God had ordained to be done in that worldly sanctuary was all contained in the old covenant, in the first covenant. He gave them all the rules of their service and the worldly sanctuary. Jump down to verse number 8 there in Hebrews 9. The Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. So what he's explaining is that that tabernacle, those rules, that divine service was a figure or a picture for the time then present. It was a way for them to see what God is trying to teach them. It's an illustration. It's a figure for those people at that time to understand God's truth and these sacrifices, it says, they could not make him that did the service perfect. The sacrifices that they made did not wash away their sins. It did not make them complete. It did not, you know, wash away their sins at all as pertaining, as, as pertaining to the conscience. And then it says in verse 10, and this is extremely important because this is where we're seeing the whole change in the law, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. The time of reformation is a reforming. We're not talking about the Catholic Reformation. Right. We're talking about the, Re the Reformation that came when Jesus Christ came and said, okay, there's a change in the law. Amen. He's reforming the law. He's making the changes here because under the, the, the Aaron, the Aaronic priesthood, this is the way they do the service. But those, those things were just a picture. Now I'm here. See, this, the, the pictures that, that was being painted was, was the lamb sacrifices, the blood being shed, the sprinkling upon the mercy seat, all of that stuff was a picture for, of Christ who was to come. And when Christ offered up himself, that set the final sacrifice, that lamb sacrifice, his blood was shed on the ground. Not a bone of him was broken. He was perfect. He was sinless. He was without spot like the lamb was supposed to be for the Passover lamb. His body was burned or his soul was burning in hell. They buried his body in a tomb. Burnt with fire. That's what's supposed to happen to the Passover lamb. Make sure it's not sodden with water. Make sure you don't boil it. Make sure you don't do anything else with it. It needs to be roast with fire. And anything that doesn't last until the morning, you burn in the fire. Very explicit. Jesus fulfilled that picture. 
This is all it was. It was a picture. The lamb that was being killed every year for Passover it was just a lamb. It's just an animal. Just a creation. The blood was being shed on the ground. And all it's doing is just continually reminding you of what's to come. The better covenant is coming. The better covenant is coming. And it's to help people understand that. The Reformation came with Christ. And he, it says right here, it was meats and drinks, divers washings and carnal ordinance. Carnal means fleshly. Fleshy, you know, fleshly type of ordinances. Now, which animals you sacrifice and the way that you do it and everything, those are carnal ordinances. When you look at the meats and the drinks, what they were allowed to eat, they had dietary restrictions, as well as meat and drink offerings that were given under this priesthood and, of course, the divers' washings. The uncleanliness, the, you know, you're unclean until even when you do this and when you do that and you need to do these washings and, and the different rituals that were associated with that. Those were the things that stood until the time of Reformation, until the time of the change. And this is explicitly laid out for us. This is where the change comes in. Let's jump down to verse number 16 here. We're going to keep reading. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is, no, it is of no strength at all while a testator liveth. Whereupon, neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary, look at this, that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So the pattern that was made here on earth of what's actually in heaven, the, the, the tabernacle in heaven, the pattern that was formed here, yeah, of course, they, they had to sanctify it with blood. They had to shed the blood because it was a picture of what was going on in heaven. But see, they couldn't offer the better sacrifice. So this is all they had to work with. They said, well, we've got some animals, so we can do that. And God said, that's enough. It's going to get my point across, but it's not going to actually do the work that needs to be done for your sal salvation. Right. And that's where Christ comes in. It says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true. Again, it's saying it's a picture, it's a figure of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. And it goes on and on. Jesus Christ, when he died on that cross, he shed his blood, he went to hell for three days and three nights, rose again from the dead. And when he ascended up into heaven, he sprinkled that blood, his blood offering on the mercy seat. He, you know, the same way that they performed the ritual here on earth was performed up in heaven, except with the perfect sacrifice that only needed to be made one time. Right. And, and fulfilling all. All of those things. And, and the things that we don't observe today, the very reason is because it's been fulfilled. It was a picture. It was an understanding showing up to that point what still needed to happen. Once it's happened, there's no more point. Now we look back on what's happened. Now we have other ordinances that we look at today, such as observing the Lord's Supper and His body, you know, the, drinking the, the, the wine and, and, the, and eating the bread that represents His blood and His flesh that was given for us instead of the Passover. And it's a way of looking back and, and honoring and recognizing what He's done for us. And again, taking the communion, right, participating in that, it doesn't save you. It doesn't wash away your sins. It doesn't do any of that. It's another picture. It's another representation of something that happened. Now, it's something that we do, and we, in, in this church, we do it once a year, we do it every year, as a way to not forget, as a way to look back, as something that has been ordained. But it's not something that, um, that saves you. Right. Now, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> Hebrews 10, verse number 1. The law having a shadow of good things to come 
and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. Again, it's reiterating the same thing. Those animal sacrifices, they couldn't make you perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshipers, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sins. Once you've made the sacrifice, your conscience of sins should be cleared. I mean, it should, you should be absolved. You should be pardoned. But that wasn't the case because the blood of bulls and goats can't do that for you. Let's keep reading here. Verse 3. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every single year. Every year they do that. For it is not possible, verse 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. The blood of bulls and goats never have been capable of taking away sins. And that's why it's, it's explaining here when Jesus came into the world, God's not looking for the sacrifice and offering. He said, that's not what it's all about. He didn't come here to show us, see, I'm going to offer up the perfect, you know, th these sacrifices. I'm just going to offer up these lambs because that's what the law says and that, you know, and, and that's what I'm here to do. No, he came to fulfill that. And it says that, um, you know, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. It means you didn't want me to do that, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. That doesn't satisfy God. That's not what he's looking for to atone for your sins. He's not looking for the blood of bulls and of goats. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. This is what's taken away. The, the blood sacrifices, the, the animal sacrifices, that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We are sanctified through Jesus Christ, of course, his one sacrifice. He's replaced the animal sacrifice. Now he's got the more perfect sacrifice, and we, are, we are, receive our sanctification once for all time. We don't need continual sacrifices. Just like you don't need to get saved over and over and over and over and over and over again. You don't need to keep on going to Jesus. Look, you get saved one time. Jesus paid for your sins one time. You accept that one time, and you're saved eternally. It's once for all. This is an explicit change in the law. And, and when you read, because didn't, we didn't read the entire chapters here. We're kind of skipping around a little bit. I mean, we're covering quite a bit of ground, not going to every single verse, but check it out later. So far, when you're reading through the book of Hebrews, I gave you some of the synopsis of some of the other chapters. Even in Hebrews 7, you know, it's talking about the tithing. It never mentioned any changes. The changes are really mentioned after that. And here's an explicit change. So he takes away the first. He may establish the second. This is where the actual changes come into the law. The sacrifices were taken away. They're part of the carnal ordinances. Look at verse number 16 here in Hebrews 10. This is the covenant that I will make with him, with them, excuse me, after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. We don't have to do any more sin offerings. Right. It changed. Jesus Christ did that once for all. And this is the biggest point being made by far throughout the entire book of Hebrews. It's to get it through their heads that, look, all of these sacrifices and all this stuff you did. And, and, you know, it's important because it needs to be stressed, especially for what they're doing, because it became such a big part of their life for, year, for, for hundreds of years. I mean, they were doing this and doing the sacrifices and doing, you know, and this is what they knew. And this is what their fathers knew, and this is what their grandfathers, you know, and, and going back and back to generations. So he needs to make this extremely clear. That's why it's, it goes in so far in depth about the priesthood, about Melchizedek, about the offerings, and about, look, it's all about faith, folks. And, it, and it's like an unveiling, an, a bigger unveiling of truth, which is what it is. Saying the stuff that, that you, didn't, you maybe didn't quite understand this before, I'm explaining it all to you right now. Jesus Christ, he paid the sacrifice. We don't need to do this anymore. And, that, and like I said, that is the biggest 
area. And, and that's mainly where you're just going to find the changes in, to the law anyways. Is, is it has to do primarily with that service um, in, in the tabernacle or in the, in the temple. The service of, of the sacrifices. That is the main place where the, where the change is made. There's a couple other details, again, that have been fulfilled, but that's where you're going to find most of it. Turn, if you would, now to Romans chapter 3. And read the rest of Hebrews, because then Hebrews 10 is followed up by, guess what? Hebrews chapter 11. And Hebrews chapter 11 is known as the faith chapter, right? Which goes in even further to talk about how all of these people in the Old Testament had faith. He talks about Moses and Abraham and, you know, and Sarah and all these great people in the Bible that had faith. Which just confirms everything else along the way that it's never been by these sacrifices. That's never been what God is looking for. He's always been looking for the faith. And here's all the examples, all the prophets, all the people that had faith in God. So is the law made void? Because I've, I've heard this before. Is the law made void in the New Testament? Well, the law is gone, right? No. And actually, where people even get that, we're going to get to this in a, in a couple minutes in Romans. It boggles my mind that you could even come up with this, but, it, but it, what it shows is the deceptiveness of a lot of preaching out there when you're not digging into scriptures. Right? We're going to a lot of scriptures tonight, and we might run a little bit late tonight. And I'm not going to apologize for that because this is important. Now, this is a little bit more of a deep study, and I hope you could stay with me. But it's extremely important that we have a full grasp and concept of this because a lot of people are out there trying to teach you that law's done. Jesus Christ got rid of the law. We're under grace, man. The law is gone. It's false. Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 28. Great soul winning verse. I use this verse often. Romans 3.28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Isn't that what we already saw in the book of Hebrews? Yes, absolutely. There's no change in salvation. It's always been that way. But there was a change to the law as far as doing the animal sacrifices. Verse 29. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is, not, is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God, which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. So right, very clearly, Romans 3.31, do we make void the law through faith? Because Jesus Christ has come and we need to have faith in him to be saved. Does that mean that the law is just void? God forbid. Of course the law is not void. Yet we established the law. The law and the prophets foretold Jesus Christ coming. It's established through Jesus Christ's birth, life, death, and resurrection. It is established. I mean, it is, that is of God. We're not nullifying or voiding God's law at all because we believe salvation is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 4, look at verse 15. The Bible reads, Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. He's saying, look, when there's not a law, if, we, if, if the law was made void, meaning it's, it's empty, it's done away with, then there would be no sin. Right. So then, if, that, if when Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again from the dead, if that's the point where, see, the law is made void, then you don't have sinners anymore. Then none of us are sinners because there's no more law. And how much sense does that make? Then why do you even need a Savior if there's no law? There absolutely is a law. It is not made void at all. Not one little bit is the law made void. Where there's no law, there's no transgression. There's no sin. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 13. It says the same thing. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. If there's no law, God can't hold you responsible for breaking something that doesn't exist. If there's no law, how are you going to be held responsible? If we live in a state and there's no laws, then you could do whatever you want because how could someone say, Oh, you can't kill people. Why? I mean, you could say, you could say why, but there's no law. There's no penalty. You can't, you can't hold, you know, there, there needs to be a law. There needs to be something to say, you could do this, you can't do this. God created a law for us and is not void. It is still exists today. This is New Testament. It's all New Testament. We're trying to understand what exists from the Old Testament. What, what has been changed? Well, is the law gone? Well, we've seen three 
uh, places already in the book of Romans that the law still exists and how ridiculous it would be to say that the law is void. Now, people, turn if you go to Romans chapter 6 because people are going to take this next verse and make all kinds of false doctrines with this one verse, which just shows you, and when we read this, obviously the people who teach what we're going to look at didn't read Romans 3, didn't read Romans 4, didn't read Romans 5 because they like this one verse in Romans chapter 6 and they're just going to take it and run with it. And they're not going to show you all the rest of these verses that explain the whole concept of what we're learning here. It's important that three times in these three chapters we're seeing the law still exists. The law is not void. The law is still there. Because when we get to Romans chapter 6, look at verse number 12. The Bible reads, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. That's the verse that they like to use. See, you're not under the law, you're under grace. See, there is no law for you because you're not under the law, you're under grace. Well, is the law made void? Is that what that's saying? No. This statement, you're not under the law, but under grace, is not saying that the law is null and void. That is not what it means. Otherwise, it contradicts what we've already read in the same exact epistle. Right. The same exact epistle. I mean, I can pull it from anywhere else. I mean, how, how schizophrenic can you be to say, well, the, 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 there's no more law because we're not under the law. We're under grace. But that's what these preachers are going to preach these days because they, they don't want to preach on sin. They don't want to offend anybody and they don't like, they don't love God. They don't love people because they don't want people getting right with God. They want everyone just to feel good about themselves and just keep doing what you're doing. That's wickedness. We're not under the law, but under grace. Look at verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. How could we sin if the law was null and void? There would be no law. There would be no sin. Obviously, he's not saying you're not under the, we're not under law in the sense that the law is void. We're not under the law in the sense that we're not under the, the, the penalty of the law by facing an eternal damnation. That's what we're free. We're free from the curse of the law. Because right. the law brings a curse. And the curse is, is death and hell. That's the curse. We are free. We are no longer bound by that curse. Because we have grace. Because God has shown us forgiveness. Because Jesus Christ has paid for our sins and we're washing His blood. That is why we receive that is why we're not under the law, but under grace. But it doesn't mean the law doesn't exist for us or for anybody else. Right. The law is still there. It still has force. People are still sent to hell because of the law. And this is further explained in Romans chapter 10, verse 4, where the Bible reads, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. It's not the end of the law, period. It's the end of law for righteousness. For you to be considered righteous in God's eyes, you're not going to attain that through the law. And you, you are no longer... See, God, everyone has a standard. Standards are the same for everyone. God set up a law. He expects you not to break His law. Those are the rules, right? I made the law. You follow the law. You need to keep the law for your righteousness. As soon as you break the law, you're not righteous. You no longer are righteous. Now you owe a penalty. But the end of having to follow the law for your righteousness happens when you put your faith in Christ. Amen. That's when that stops. That's when you're no longer held to that standard. Why? You've, you already haven't met the standard, but now you've received grace. That is where you're covered from those sins. I mean, that, and, and, and it's as simple as that. The, the end of the law is the end of the curse of the law. It's the end of the, the, the penalty or the punishment and, and, and having to keep the law for our righteousness, for our salvation, when we could re get Jesus Christ's righteousness imputed unto us. We could get His righteousness and not have to rely on our own because we don't have our own righteousness. 
Turn if you would to uh, Matthew chapter 5, because we're going to see what Jesus said. We've already seen what the Apostle Paul said, even though it's all God saying it. Matthew chapter 5. I mean, if anyone's going to explain what the changes are made, is it going to be Jesus? I mean, we're going to see here, is the law gone? Is the law void? Matthew 5, 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Is he coming to do away with the law? No. Is he making void the law? No. I am not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. Let's keep reading here. Verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Then the law is not going anywhere until everything is completed. Wherefore, or who, excuse me, whosoever therefore shall break one of, the le one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. He's saying, oh, you want to you wanna tell everybody that sin's just fine? Go ahead and do whatever you want because we're not under the law, we're under grace. He's saying, guess what? You're called least in the kingdom of heaven. When you do and teach men, other people, oh yeah, don't worry about it. Oh, yeah, you're under grace. Oh, yeah, that law, don't worry about the law anymore. Christ came. We're under grace, brother. He said, when you break the least of my commandments, the least of them, I expect you to keep all my commandments still, even after salvation, I expect you to keep them. And when you're teaching other people, oh, not a big deal. We don't have to, we don't have to mess with that law anymore. He said, if you're saved, you're going to be least in the kingdom of heaven. I mean, your, your, your salvation's not changing. You got a free gift, Right? But if you think that, that it's okay just to break God's commandments and just not, not a big deal, not a problem, you got another thing coming. He says, but if you follow them, smallest commandment, you, 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 you know, obey a commandment, say hey, you're going to be great in the kingdom of heaven. That's Jesus' teaching. Verse 20, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter in the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. So now he's bringing up an aspect of the law, right? Saying, hey, the law says not to kill. Verse 22, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Doesn't sound to me like Jesus is getting rid of the law one bit. And if anything, he's making it even more strict. He's saying, you know what? Yeah, you heard him say not to kill. Now I'm saying don't even get angry with your brother without a cause. Right? Jesus did not say the law was void anywhere. In fact, he said the exact opposite. The Apostle Paul did not say the law was void. The book of Hebrews does not say the law was void. The only changes we have seen explicitly laid out is the meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances. There's three ways to look at what is expected of us in the New Testament. Three ways that I could think of, at least. You could look at the New Testament and say, well, only what's stated in the New Testament is what we need today. Some people do that. And I showed you, you know, the two books. Well, all we need to worry about is the New Testament. Don't worry about the Old Testament. That's one way of looking at it. Another way is to say, well, everything in the Old Testament and New Testament, we have to watch all of it. It all still stands today. There's no changes made. Every single last bit, we should be doing the sacrifices, we should be doing the feast, we should be, you know, you could look at it that way. Or you could say everything stands unless it's been specifically changed in the New Testament. Now, number one doesn't make much sense. Things not mentioned in the New Testament, right? If you're, if you're going to say, well, only what's, what Jesus talked about, or only what the New Testament says. Well, there's a lot of things not mentioned in the New Testament. Are you going to say that it's okay to commit bestiality? Or incest? Or how about performing child sacrifices? You know, things that just aren't mentioned explicitly by name in the New Testament. And there's many more. I was just I was going off the top of my head. So if you find this somewhere in there, forgive me, you know, like, oh, the New Testament does talk about this. But it doesn't talk about bestiality. It doesn't talk about incest. I know that for sure. The child sacrifices, I don't think it talks about that either. Being explicitly saying, you know, not to do it. Right. The law does say it. All of those things. The law states those things explicitly. 
Are these all okay now in the New Testament because they're not explicitly mentioned? Is it just good now? Because see, what people want to do is say, well, I don't like what it says about the Sodomites. I don't like what it says about adulterers. I don't like what it says about fill in the blank. And it doesn't say that. Jesus didn't talk about that in the New Testament, so why do we have to listen about that? Yeah. Well, then what are you going to do about the, 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 the bestiality, the, the child sacrifice, and the incest? Because it's okay too then, right? Because we just want to be permissive about everything and just throw away the majority of your Bible. Doesn't make any sense. Number two doesn't make any sense either. Because then why would you not do the animal sacrifices? I mean, if there's been no change at all, we just need to observe everything. First of all, you're throwing away the clear scriptures where we saw about the change to the law. That there is a change. But secondly, then I don't know anybody who's performing animal sacrifices today. I don't know anyone who's building an altar of earth. Right? And, and getting lambs and, and bulls and goats and performing all these, in these sacrifices and finding a Levite and you know, getting him to do all this stuff. Nobody does that today. So if that's what you believe, then you're a hypocrite because you don't really believe it. You're, you're just saying whatever, you know, whatever. And number three is, is the right way. I mean, it's, it's the only thing that even makes sense. Everything stands in the Bible and all of God's word unless it's been specifically changed, unless there's been something said to say, yeah, you know what? Here's a difference here. Here's a change. Turn, if you would, to, um, let's see where I want you to turn. We're almost done. We're, we're doing all right one time. We're almost done. Let's, we'll turn to all these references. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 10. I'm going to go over three other changes, essentially three other changes that we didn't quite cover. You know, Hebrews is, is very general. It says the, the, the drinks, the divers' washings, the carnal ordinances, and the meats. Those are explicit, but... You know, that's, that's all it really mentions in the whole book of Hebrews, are those things. Not very much. Not very much at all. But see, also have people say, oh, well, that was just for the Israelites at that time, and, you know, like for all of the law. They had a theocracy, and that was only for that, you know, it's like, really? God's truth, and God's perfect law, and God's righteousness, and what he was telling them, the way things should be, Oh, that's only if you were an Israelite back in those days. That shouldn't be, the, that's, not, that's not just today. That's not proper for today's society or today's world. Why not? Where, where do you get that from the Bible? Where, where do you get God's law and God's judgments and God's punishments as being not righteous anymore today and that whatever you think is, is better? Doesn't line up. Acts chapter 10, we're going to see where the, the dietary restrictions came in. Now, the dietary restrictions, they came with Moses. If you go back and read the Bible, there was no dietary restrictions. Well, there was a dietary restriction given to Adam and Eve on the one tree, right? the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, everything else, you could eat everything else. But that's the one I don't want you to eat from, right? So they had a dietary restriction. Well, after they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, guess what? They couldn't do it anyway, so... They were free to eat whatever they wanted. They didn't have the clean and the unclean beast or anything like that. They could eat whatever they wanted. Moses' law comes. Now all of a sudden, there's a big distinction and very explicit. These are the types of animals you could eat. These you cannot eat. Right? So there was prior to that, there was no restriction. Then there was Mosaic law. And then after that, in the New Testament, we're going to see that that dietary restriction has been lifted because, again, it was a figure for the time then present. It was teaching them something. It was showing them something about their sanctification that was fulfilled and changed in the New Testament under the new uh, priesthood. Look at verse number 10 of Acts 10. This is talking about Peter when he fell into a trance. It says here, And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou uncommon. And this is a vision from God where God is speaking to Peter in a dream, in this trance, and, and he's telling Peter, Peter, eat these animals. And Peter's saying, look, Lord, you know, 
I, I am following your dietary restrictions in the, in the law. Like, I, I'm not going to, I haven't, I've never eaten anything like that before. I've never eaten anything you told me not to eat before. And he says, you know what? What I've cleansed, don't call that uncommon. Don't call that unclean. Don't call that common. Don't call that unclean. He's saying, I've cleansed that. And then, you know, later on, as you read the book of Acts, he realizes what the greater teaching is as he's called to go and preach unto some Gentiles. He said, oh, okay, I get it now. See, the oracles of God were revealed unto the Jews. There was Jerusalem, and they were a spotlight. They were this lighthouse in a dark world where God was revealing everything unto them. And when people wanted to become a Jew, basically they just immigrated to Israel. Because, you know, if they wanted to do that, that's, that's essentially what they ended up doing. Okay? They didn't really go out unto these other heathen nations they were kind of more coming to them. Now, I'm not saying that never happened. I'm not saying they never evangelized or tried to get people from other nation, but they basically kind of kept everything in-house. God's word was being delivered to them here in Jerusalem, and that was the, the order of service was from, you know, from the temple and the tabernacle and everything else was all relayed through the people in that nation of Israel. That's where God was doing his revealing of his word. That changed in the New Testament. When God opened it up and told them, hey, go out into all the world. Go out to all the corners of the earth. Go out everywhere and preach the gospel. And they started setting up the churches. And God was able to use people all over the place to preach his word. And, um, you know, when God has cleansed that, he says, okay, the, the difference between the clean and the unclean beasts was a, another picture between the children of Israel and the Gentiles. And, you know, and other people were saying, I've changed that. Now, we're going to you know, go ahead and, and, and it's okay to, to speak unto these people. And we're going to see here, turn if you go to Romans chapter 14. Because it's not just this one little dream where, where this, uh, this change is being represented. It's, it's one of the places, not very many places that talk about the changes, but this is one of them. And then in Romans 14... We're going to see, again, talking about our diet, the things that we eat, and what is acceptable and what's not acceptable, as well as observing the feasts and the holy days and the Sabbath. Verse 14, or, uh, chapter 14, verse 2, For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. So you got one guy who believes, hey, I could eat whatever. And then you got another person who's, who says who is weak, who said, well, I'm only going to eat vegetables, right? Only herbs. Verse number three, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. So he's saying that, you know, basically the guy who's eating anything is right. He's, he's able to eat whatever, because you can't judge him for eating what he's eating because he's not breaking the law. He could eat whatever he wants. Now, the person who's only eating herbs, that's fine too. You know, you don't have to eat meat. You don't have to eat something other than vegetables. Go ahead and eat that. But if he's eating it because he doesn't think he, he is allowed of God because he might be breaking some law that, res that, that restricts him from eating anything other than herbs, well, he's weak. He doesn't understand that, yeah, he can eat everything. But that's okay. You know, that's not that big of a deal. He's not sinning by, by, by holding himself to a certain standard that he doesn't really need to be holding himself to because it doesn't exist, but that's okay. You know, he's saying not that big of a deal. You don't need to, to make a big issue out of that. But it's also showing that the person who, who eats, there's nothing wrong with that either, meaning that the, the dietary restrictions have been lifted. And then um, with the days, it says in verse 5, one man esteemeth one day above another, Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. And then turn if you go to Colossians chapter 2. We're going to see one more um, major passage that, that covers some of these changes in the law. And I'm not, you know, there's a lot. I, I didn't really bring up much about the Sabbath 
Because that's an entire sermon in and of itself. I mean, there's really a lot of material there, and I, I'm just kind of covering a few of the just... And, and this is, there's really not many other changes that are made to the law other than what we've already gone over. The last one's going to be circumcision. That was one other change. And again, that started with Abraham. That didn't even start with... Now, it was part of the Mosaic Law. It said, you know, on the eighth day that, that you know, the male child was supposed to be circumcised and everything else. That was given in part of the law, but it, it, it originated with Abraham. It didn't originate even with, with the Mosaic Law. Um, So Colossians 2, look at verse number 10, the Bible reads, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So again, I mean, this is explaining the symbolism, the symbolic meaning behind the physical circumcision. He's talking about the circumcision made without hands. The putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. By receiving Christ, your heart is circumcised. Okay, and that's, that's you know, and I've got one more passage to back that up. But let's keep reading in verse number 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink. Meat and drink, we saw that in the book of Hebrews too. Remember that? Those were changed law. So don't let anyone judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Almost the same exact wording that we find in Hebrews saying, you know what, this was a figure for the time then present. This was a shadow of the things to come. These are the things that have changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. We had a reason for them. There's there there a purpose for it. It's part of God's law, but the meats, the drinks, the holy days, we don't, we don't celebrate the, the feast days. We don't celebrate any of those things. The new moons or the Sabbath days. Those high days, the Sabbath, we don't, we, don't, we don't recognize those anymore as a part of the law because they've been changed, they've been fulfilled. And just quickly on the, you know, on the Sabbath day, Jesus Christ is our rest. So the, the symbolism there is that, you know, and, and it was very serious to God, nobody works on the seventh day, on the Sabbath day. It's a rest. I don't want you doing anything. I don't want you preparing food. I don't want you getting, you know, making fires. I don't want you doing anything. It's rest. Showing that you can work the six days, but that seventh day is rest. We can't, and, and the main reason of that is that we can't earn or work for our salvation. We need to enter into Christ. We need to receive Christ as Savior. And when we receive Him, we enter into His rest, Amen. where we can cease from our own works. We can stop working for our salvation. We could stop trying to obey the law to be saved and completely rest in Christ. So when he came, he fulfilled the Sabbath days. We don't need to observe that anymore and it's clearly laid out here. Like, Don't let anyone judge you because you don't not work on the Sabbath day. Because you're not celebrating the holy days. Because you're not uh, eating or you know, following these dietary restrictions. Because you eat shellfish. It's not a problem anymore. The law has changed. That aspect of the law has changed. Law is not null and void. But those, um, those areas have changed. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Last place. Last reference. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. This just covers a little bit more about circumcision. Okay, because that was another, another change made to the law. Meats, drinks, divers, washings, carnal ordinances, holy days, new moons, Sabbath days, and circumcision have changed in the law. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 18, Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? 
Let them not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Whether you get saved when you're circumcised or not doesn't matter, and you don't have to change it after you get saved. Saying, don't worry about it. Doesn't matter. And again, that's, that's a whole other sermon that could be preached just on, on all the symbolism and meanings and everything else behind that. But I want to do a, a brief overview here of the, of the changes made to the law. How can we understand the Old Testament versus the New Testament? Honestly, God's the same God. He doesn't change. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. There, you know, our God isn't just, um, you know, he doesn't just change his mind all the time. He's not a man that he should repent. There is a law. There is a purpose for it. The law still stands. Sin still exists. We can't just start throwing things away because we don't like them that's found in the Bible. You need to understand that, that everything that you read is still applicable unless it's explicitly been done away or you know, been fulfilled is probably the best word that's used in, that I think in the Bible. It's, Jesus Christ fulfilled that. So we don't, we don't observe those anymore. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for your words, dear God. I pray that you would please help us to, to learn and understand more from your words, dear Lord. Help us to, to be able to read and study your word, dear God, without, um, without distraction and that you would teach us, dear Lord, and help us not to be deceived by, by those that want to make a mockery or ridicule us that, that are trying to serve you and to obey your commandments, dear Lord. And I pray that you please help us not to become flippant over our, our own observance of your rules and your laws for us, dear Lord. We know that, that you treat it very seriously and you, if you didn't expect us or demand us to, to obey them, dear Lord, then you wouldn't have, have given them to us. Uh, help us to respect your words and show the, the love and, and um, thankfulness that we have through our own salvation by being more obedient and not stiff-necked when we, when we hear your word preached. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.